Alrighty, let's see where we left off here. We left off at uh, Jesus uh, talked about a lot of weddings. Um, Jesus went to these public events. He also went to funerals. Um, there's there's events people have in their life that sometimes uh, have a really big. I would say most of the time it has a real big effect on the rest of their life. Uh, weddings is one of them, and funerals are one of them. Um, sometimes when a loved one passes away, uh, there's some kind of niche that they had in people's life that is now empty, and they have to learn how to fill that emptiness with something. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Um, so it doesn't surprise me Jesus was there uh, on, on these occasions. Turn to Luke 7. Luke 7, and we'll look at one of these occasions where he goes to a funeral. And you know, uh, people nowadays, uh, there was a time when people got dressed up for anything. Uh, people would get dressed for dinner. Um, they would get dressed to go out for the evening. Uh, even if they were going to eat at, uh, you know, some kind of restaurant somewhere. Um, nowadays, people don't dress up as much, but there's two occasions where they do dress up. That's weddings and funerals. That shows you how uh, in high esteem we have, we, we hold these things. Um, and, and look, when you go to a funeral, the, the person in the coffin is gone. You're just looking at a shell. And, uh, but it's a good time emotionally to say goodbye. And you do need to say goodbye to loved ones when they go. You really do. Even if you didn't get along with them, there's still a need to do that. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And it came to pass uh, the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. So he goes to this little town. Um... And uh, a bunch of people have come with him. Uh, there was a time when Jesus had a, just a, a lot of people that were following him around. More than just the 12. Uh, they were like his inner circle. But you had a whole crowd of people. And so this is the time when Jesus had this crowd of people traveling everywhere. He kind of hangers on, I guess. Uh, now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. So they come to go into the city of Nain, and here's the funeral uh, procession coming out of the gate. That they they want to go in. Uh, and that's very common. It used to be that, uh, uh, you know, you see these old movies, uh, like old western towns and cowboy movies, and the graveyard is always just out of town somewhere, and that's, that's pretty accurate. They put the graveyard out of town, not only because of the uh, disease problem and the smells that came from a graveyard. Um, if they didn't bury someone well enough, uh, they didn't have sealed coffins like we do now. Um, a lot of times they just wrap people up and they'd bury them. Uh, and of course, Jesus' day, rich people would have some kind of crypt, whether it be a cave or, or something, and they would put people uh, in an area and... Um, the land of Israel has all kinds of limestone caves, so there's lots of places to put uh, dead bodies somewhere. Nowadays, we build little, uh, you know, little things in the graveyards. Uh, New Orleans is famous for those because if you dig two feet down in the ground in New Orleans, you got water, so you got to bury them pretty much above ground. So uh, the crypt thing, but the funeral thing is coming out of the city, and he's there. And when the Lord saw her, uh, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And it came that he touched the beer. He didn't even touch the body. He touched the, 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 the little bed or whatever they were carrying this guy on. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And uh, he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him unto his mother, and uh, there came a great fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen among them, that God hath visited 
uh, his people. Um, and, and that was a mark of a prophet. Uh, if you study the Old Testament, there's a story about uh, um, the, the prophet running from something and he, and he ends up falling in this grave, freshly dug grave with the guys in it, and, and he touches this guy and the guy comes up out of the grave. Uh, so resurrection was a miracle from God that people in those days recognized as uh, the power of God. Now, nobody does this today, despite what they claim. Uh, the guy that started all this thing down in Brownsville, their assembly of God down there, he claimed to brought a dead baby back to life. But funniest thing, they could never produce that baby, uh, you know, years after no one came forth and said, I'm the kid that this guy resurrected. So, you know, they'll just tell stories. Well, this had enough witnesses that uh, it was it was true what Jesus did. And, and the word spread around when Jesus would do these things. Now, changing water into wine, the story that we're studying in John 2, was really uh, nothing compared with this. This is bringing back the dead to life. I mean, that's, 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 that's really something. Um, God decides when you're born and when you die. Now, obviously this man's time had come, but the mother was having such a hard time. Notice Jesus had compassion on her. A lot of things that Jesus did to people, he did because he, he had compassion on them. He saw their suffering, and it hurt his heart to see other people suffer. And uh, that's a good thing about the Lord. He doesn't want to see us suffer, even when it's our fault. He, uh, I, I mean, he didn't have to help Adam and Eve after the garden, but he did. He, he gave them clothes and, and showed them, you know, uh, you need to go out there and become farmers now. He could have just let them wander off and starve to death, but he didn't do that. He, he told them what to do. Um, in John chapter 11, of course, we're not going to turn there. That's the story uh, of uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus. And, of course, he raises Lazarus. Uh, from the grave. So Jesus went to these things, and, and I don't know, um, the Jews have bar mitzvahs and uh, bat mitzvahs for the girls now. Uh, I, I don't know that they had anything really like that in the Old Testament or New Testament. It's not really mentioned. Um, they took Jesus to the temple when he was 12, and he was talking to the doctors um, when they went looking for him. Um, because they, they missed him in the crowd that was going to and fro. And maybe that's where they got the idea for those kind of things. When I was a Lutheran, uh, and the Catholic Church does this, uh, uh, some of the Methodist churches do it, the Presbyterians sometimes do it. Um, but they, they confirm someone when they're 12. You go to this class and you learn from this little book of um, like Bible facts. And it's called a catechism. And you learn the catechism and then... Uh, you have a, a kind of a board that questions you, and then you have your confirmation service, and, and, and poof, you're put into the church. Well, that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says you're lost, you get saved, and you go join a local church. That's how it works, amen? So that's what we do. That's what makes Baptists so unpopular sometimes, because we're oddballs. We don't do same, the same thing as the bigger churches and uh, other churches do. We, uh, especially Bible believers, we stick with the book. And sometimes that'll make you a, a kind of an odd thing. Um, but they, uh, this wedding that Jesus went to had a problem. There was a problem at the party. It wasn't a big problem. They had run out of stuff to, to, to serve their guests to drink. Um... You know, uh, there's, there's worse things that can happen uh, at a party. Um, sometimes, whenever you have a family gathering, sometimes there's difficulties. Um, usually there's one person in the family who doesn't seem to get along with the rest of the family. It was like my family. Um, and then you got that problem. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We're going to look at uh, a couple problems here. Did I say Romans 11? I meant Romans 4. I didn't see the little mark in there. My pencil wasn't working good. 
Romans 4. 4, yes. See, I mean, it's all handwritten there. Sometimes I can't read my own handwriting. Probably should use a sharper pencil. Or get a darker pencil. Verse number one. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness um, uh, upon the um, circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, how was it then reckoned uh, when he was circumcised in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Uh, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, that were not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who walk also walk in the steps of the faith uh, of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. For the promise that he would should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. He said, "What in the world does have to, all this have to do with Jesus and the wedding?" Well, I want you to notice that. Here's another ceremony that the Jews had that uh, everybody observes today. Nobody says much about it because of, uh, you know, what it is. But it's the, um, the rite of circumcision. Uh, people, they have discovered medically that circumcision is good. It's healthier uh, for baby boys to be circumcised. The Jews made a, a kind of a, a ritual of it, a ceremony of it. And... Uh, I want you to notice that here Jesus, um, or Paul is saying uh, that Jesus brought upon us the blessings of Abraham. Uh, look, Abraham, when he was first uh, over there in Ur of the Chaldees, uh, he was called Abram. And he was a, a Chaldean, I guess, or some sort of uh, person that was from that era. A and... Uh, God came and he spoke to Abram. And he told him to leave his land and come over to another land. And he said, I'll give you this land. Um, so, as he was dealing with God, God, God started doing things to him to draw him apart and to separate him from the other people that lived around him. And one of those things was the circumcision. Um, remember uh, when... Uh, some of the uh, uh, Canaanites, uh, they got looking at Jacob's daughter, Dinah. And, uh, uh, of course, one of them messed around with her. And so the brothers say, well, we'll handle this. And they went to these people and they said, okay, you can marry into our tribe and we'll marry into yours. But you got to be circumcised. And so all these people were circumcised. And, of course, they played a dirty trick on them. And they came into the city where everybody was uh, trying to recover from being circumcised. And they, they killed everybody and, uh, as a revenge. And, of course, Jacob said that, you know, that really wasn't a good thing to do. Um, but notice there's a promise involved in verse number 13. And notice that the promise comes to us uh, through the righteousness of faith. Now, um, when Jesus came in the Gospels, uh, the Jews were used to doing something one way, okay? Uh, when they ran out of wine at a wedding, it, it was a problem. They, they either had to go out and buy some more grapes real quick or nobody got anything more to drink. 
uh, or when their cart broke down or when they got sick, things just took their natural course of, of doing things. And that's what they were used to. And all of a sudden, here pops up this guy. He can raise the dead. He can heal the blind. He can uh, cause the, the lame to walk again. He can make water into wine. And you know what? He can raise the dead people uh, in the graveyard and ha have you, uh, you know, uh, have more time with your loved one. And they rejected all that. Um. I thank God that Abraham didn't reject it, neither did David. Uh, because through them, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. He's from their physical families. And he brought this promise to us. We have a promise that really doesn't, wasn't designed for us. We have, we have the, the Jews. Uh, now, that doesn't mean God isn't going to do anything for the Jews later on. He's going to bring them back. But while they're kind of being uh, set on the, uh, the, the naughty seat, as it were, with God, uh, we can come in and we can be saved and we can get an inheritance uh, in the millennium. And uh, yeah, you do have to work for that. Um, but you couldn't work for it if you weren't saved in the first place. Now, notice that it's talking about the circumcision thing. We're going to find out later, if you study the rest of some of this, that we have a spiritual circumcision. Um, we don't have to have anything physical done to us. Water baptism don't save you. Circumcision doesn't save you. Joining the church doesn't save you. What saves you is you have faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And every day, you have to trust in that thing. Whether you do or don't, you're going to keep your salvation. But believe me, your Christian life's a lot better now and in the future if you just keep trusting in the Lord. And he would come and he would do these things. Um, the Messiah, it's prophesied in, in Daniel and other places that he would come and he would have the power of God on him. So when the we read in the Gospels, you know, the Pharisees would come to him and say, we demand you give us a sign. Um, I've heard preachers uh, preach, you know, well, they had no right to demand. No, they had every right to demand the Messiah that he would give them a sign. Of course, what did Jesus tell them? He said, no sign shall be given unto you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Yeah. What is the sign of the prophet Jonah? Well... Uh, Jonah got swallowed up by the whale. He died in that whale. He was resurrected in that whale. And then the whale spit him up alive again and he went preaching. Well, that's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, and, and he says, you've already got the sign. You didn't believe it when you got it and you don't believe it now. Uh, I run into this in churches a lot when I was preaching around the country, and I know pastors have complained about it to me. There's just certain people that will come to church, um, especially when the church starts to grow and the pews start getting filled in by, by people that, you know, didn't go there before, you know, they, they'll come and they'll get right with God and they'll join the church and, and you'll get a bunch of people. Well, there's a certain section uh, that the devil seems to always put in the church and, and they, have a, they have a problem with their faith. Uh, that keeps the pastor's office busy. <laughs> um, and some of them will listen to the pastor and some of them won't listen to the pastor. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, we had a, a lady here that used to go here that was a sweet lady. Um, and she had some problems with her life. And she came to Brother Bill and he usually would get me in the office as a witness. Uh, especially if it was a female. And uh, he gave her biblical advice about her problem. I mean, it was straight from the Bible. Brother Bill was known, and I hope I get known for the same thing. People come in for advice, out comes the Bible, the Bible immediately gets opened up, and there's the thing from the scriptures. And she shook her head, yeah, that sounded okay to her. Then she went out and did the exact opposite of what the Bible said. And the thing fell apart on her. And, you know, and, and she got... She got kind of frustrated and she ended up leaving the church. I don't think there was anything in the church. It's just I think she was embarrassed because she hadn't followed the advice she was given here at the church by the pastor. And now things were all in a mess. 
And so people, rather than stick around, and look, there is nobody here that would have judged that lady. We all loved her, and it would have been fine. People that love one another can overlook a lot of stuff. But, you know, she felt like she had to leave. And uh, so uh, there, there's all kinds of problems come into people's lives. And it seemed that Jesus, uh, he was always there. But he always had something. Abraham had problems in his life. Do you remember when he lied about his wife? Yeah. Uh, he didn't have to do that, but he did that. He was scared. You say, what, what, what happened? Well, he had a little bit of doubt. He said, well, you know, God will take good care of me, and I believe in God, but, you know, I probably better just do this thing over here just as insurance. Well, do you think your insurance is better than God's insurance? <laughs> See, that, that's what this is talking about here, this circumcision and uncircumcision and imputed righteousness. You're saved because of what someone else did for you. That's what this is passage is trying to teach. Abraham believed God not because he did something, but God had done something for him. In fact, the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament, that's why they're the heroes of the faith. Because they believed in something God did for them. Prophets came, you know, like Elijah. He called fire down from heaven and what have you. Well, he didn't do that. God did that. Now, they were scared of him because he was the man of God. And all that's wonderful and, you know, great and hallelujah and all like that. But if God hadn't done that for him, he wouldn't have been a nobody. We would have never heard his name. But because God was with him and God did so many wonderful things to him and for him, uh, we remember his name. Uh, I think of Brother Roloff. Um... Bro, do you know Brother Roloff? He used to be on the radio. He had a... I'm my Uncle Charlie. Did you ever hear... No? Okay. Uh, he ran a, a big children's home. and uh, In fact, he had several of them. Uh, he had a home for women, a home for men, um, a home for boys, a home for girls. Um, he had a ranch. And um, he would help families. Um, he would help orphans. He would help... And he, he became very famous... Uh, around the country um, because the state of Texas wanted him to get a license to do what he was doing. He had been doing what he had been doing for decades. And all of a sudden he had to have a license. And he said, no, I'm not going to have a license. God did tell me to get a license. God told me to start these homes and do what I'm going to do. And of course he spent some time in jail and one thing and another. And finally he ended up uh, he had a little, uh, he had a pilot's license and he had a little plane and he was going around trying to raise money for his court costs. It's basically what he was doing. And one day he was up in the plane and uh, um, some something mechanical, I forget exactly what it was, but a, a storm came along and whatever this was failed on him and it crashed the plane and he died. But people remember him. A lot of people still remember Brother Roloff. Not really because of Brother Roloff, but what God did for Brother Roloff. He, he could have a whole line of people that would give testimonies, all the great things God was doing in their life, and, and the people got straightened out and went out and lived right and, and uh, did right and, and became you know useful members of society instead of troubled youths. That's a great thing. Um, you think about the people who uh, run the uh, Pacific Garden Rescue Mission up in Chicago. They have a little radio thing I listen to. Uh, maybe some of the people that run it now don't quite believe like we do anymore. But back in the day, uh, when they when they really believed the Bible and they were going, boy, boy, what a difference they made in people's lives. And they're not really remembered because they're a rescue mission. But what God is doing, see. That teaches us a real lesson here. Instead of going around and bragging what you do, brag of what God does. Brag what God does. God, God does some great things for us. Um, I don't speak much about my personal life because it's personal. And I don't know, I just feel bad about doing it. I feel it's kind of like cheating or something. Telling people about what happened to me. But I guess I should because God's done such great things for me. He really has. Uh, back in the days when I went to Bible school, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. But God got me through Bible school. There were times when uh, 
uh, you know, uh, I didn't have a really a, a good place to live or a good car or there's there's lots of things that we just take for granted that I didn't have. And God, God supplied those things. And there's many a time when I had troubles on the hoof, boy, and I would get down on the floor of my trailer or a house where I stayed and I would ask God to help. And, you know, sure enough, he would take care of that thing. I had some neighbors one time when I lived over in Brownsville. I thought they were going to kill each other. They were all the time shooting guns and standing up in the yard just screaming at each other. You ever seen people like that just scream at each other? You know, and here I am. I'm, I'm under the window peeking up over the window. I don't want to get shot. Uh, and... Uh, and, and, and finally, uh, uh, they moved out, and that was a glorious day. <laughs> I got down one, and he said, I thank the Lord that they were gone. And, and the landlord from next door came over, and, and uh, he said, well, I got some new people coming in. I said, I hope they're better than the last crew that was in there. He said, yeah, I found that they weren't such a good guy. You should have come to ask. I could have told you all kinds of stories. <laughs> And he said, well, I wish you would. If something like that goes on again, you call me, okay? And uh, I never did have that problem again. But uh, God, you know, he said, what did God do? He protected me. Because I, I, I could have been stupid enough to get in the middle of something like that, you know? Um, I, I, well, I'll, I'll tell you where that was. Uh, you know, on Jack, West Jackson Street, there's a little, uh, like a little grocery store. Uh, they're right when it, uh, let's see, what is that street that comes through there? Um, Wentworth or Wentwood or something. Uh, there's the Presbyterian Church and then a couple doors down there's this little store. And my house was back on the other side of that store. And you think it's bad now. I lived in Brownsville when it was really bad. I mean, I, it was a rootin' tootin', you know, shooting. <laughs> Uh, you know, happening in place. Uh, while I lived there, they arrested Ted Bundy uh, in, in there somewhere <laughs> down the street from where I lived. You know, just to tell you what kind of people hung around there. But I'm telling you that the Lord seems to show up in the Gospels at places where they're having a problem or there's something that he can do for them. Uh, that lady didn't expect that her son was going to be coming back alive when she started down that funeral to bury the kid. Those people at that wedding weren't expecting Jesus to do something for them miraculously. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, people have real problems. Um, turn to Judges 21. Let, let, me, let me show you uh, uh, something that um, the nation of Israel got themselves in a real fix. They started fighting with one another, like armies. Say 20. 21. 21. Judges 21. They had nearly wiped out the tribe of Benjamin at this point. Benjamin was a small tribe to begin with, and they had uh, they had fought with Benjamin over uh, some things that happened, and and they technically were on the right side of the battle because they were on God's side. They they were trying to live uh, their their lives and run their country uh, under the lights of what God said in the Old Testament uh, law and stuff, but but they nearly. They nearly wiped out the tribe. Notice in verse number one, it says, Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. So not only did they kill a bunch of these people, but they were only going to keep them from marrying any of their daughters and things. So they had in their mind to wipe them out completely. This was genocide. Um... That's not very good. Even, even if you're on the right side, you can't just kill everybody, you know? Uh, and the people came into the house of God and abode there till evening before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one 
tribe lacking in Israel. And it came to pass on the morning that the people rose early and built an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the children of Israel said, Who is there among you of all the tribes of Israel that came not up with the congregation unto the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord and to Mizpah, saying he shall surely be put to death. So here, here are these people, not only are they trying to wipe out a tribe, but they're saying Any, anybody who didn't come fight with us, we're, we're going to come wipe them out too. Because they, you know, if you're not on our side, then you're on the wrong side. Um, everything about this is just about wrong, except they were trying to follow what the law said. They, they, they had the right idea about that. Aside from that, they did everything wrong. Look, you can have the right idea about something and go about it totally wrong. I've seen that lots of times. And it's always a mess when people do that. Look, it's best before you start out with something to pray about it and say, God, what do you want me to do? But they didn't do that. They, they did it after the fact. Just keep reading. This is, good. this is good. So what does this got to do with weddings? Well, we're getting there. <sighs> and the children of Israel repented them for Benjamin, their brother, and said there's one tribe cut off from Israel this day. So after all that swearing and, and we're not going to ever allow this to happen, they, they got feeling bad about it and said, well, maybe we were a little hasty. Yeah, they were. And they said, what one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mizpah unto the Lord? And behold, there came none to the camp from Jabez Gilead to the assembly. For the people were numbered, and behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead there. And the congregation sent hither 12,000 men of, valiant, of, of the valiantest, and commanded them, saying, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the children. So this is going to kill everybody. <sighs> Boy, what a thing. And this was the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every female that have lain by man. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins that had not known man by lying uh, with any male. And they brought them to the camp of, uh, to Shiloh, which is in the land of Cana. And the whole congregation sent some to speak to the children of Benjamin that were in the rock remnant. These people were holed up in a like a like a like a mountain fortress, the, the, what was left of the tribe of Benjamin. So they send some ambassadors, and yeah, it probably wasn't the greatest thing to go up to this mountain fortress because pretty soon here's an arrow, here's a spear. <laughs> you know, I mean they're they're dying. And, uh, wait a minute, we're here to talk good. Don't don't kill me. <laughs> I can just see it. Uh, we we got we we got some good news, folks. Um, and. Uh, and Benjamin came again at that time, and they were given, and they gave them wives, which they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet so they sufficed them not. So they gave them all these women uh, as wives. I guess they had a lottery or something to decide who got who. And the people repented for Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. And then the elders of the congregation said, How shall we do for uh, wise for them that remain, seeing the women are destroyed out of Benjamin. And they said, There must be an inheritance for them that it be escaped of Benjamin, that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel. Howbeit they may not be given them wives of our daughters. For the children of Israel had sworn, saying, Cursed be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin. So they're, they're, they're trying to do the right. They open their mouth. That's the other thing. Uh, be careful what you say. Uh, you may have to eat your words, and it may not taste so good. And that's what happened here. They may they made this curse, and they well, we, we, God will get us if we do that. Well, what are we going to do here? So they figured it out. Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly, and the place which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south of uh, Labona. Um, so they had a particular place in mind here. I mean, it's very specific where this place is. Don't ask me. I guess I could take a Bible map. Uh, I've got a Bible. I didn't figure out exactly where this place was. 
but it, apparently it was a place where uh, you know they could they could do whatever they had planned here. Therefore, they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyard. So there's a lot of vineyards in that area. If you've ever been to a vineyard, they got all these things sticking up, uh, you know, uh, wood things sticking up out of the ground. And then they got the kind of like a trellis over it, kind of like an old fashioned kind of clothesline sort of thing. And uh, then the vines grow and they kind of hang down. So you could hide in one of those things very easily. You can get back a couple rows and they'd never see you. And so that's what's going on here. So go hide in the vineyard. And see and behold if the daughters of Shiloh come out uh, to dance in dances. And when they come out of the vineyards, catch you, every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go into the land of Benjamin. This, to me, this is funny. So they have this thing where the women are dancing. And back in those days, the women danced with the women and the men danced with the men. They still do that in parts of the world. You know, a big circle with the men dancing and stuff and uh the women will you know have have it's kind of like a folk dance and so they're doing that and i guess they made sure all the all, all the women that were eligible to, for this uh kidnapping was uh dancing in one place and it shall be when their fathers and their brothers come to us to complain because because their daughter they didn't kidnapped uh, that we will say unto them, Be favorable unto them for our sakes, because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war, for ye did not give unto them at this time that ye should be guilty. In other words, we're not going to hold you accountable because you were in Jabez Gilead uh, or wherever you were. May, may, maybe we have we can find something against you, and you don't want that, so you better just let this slide is what to tell them. Uh, boy, what, what, what a way to work things. And the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught, and they went and returned to their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt therein. And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man uh, to his tribe and to his family, and they went out from whence thence, every man to his inheritance. Now, this is the most important verse in this whole book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which is right. How? In his own eyes. That's another thing you got to be careful. It may be right to you, but is it right to God? So, what kind of lesson is this? Well, pray about everything. Pray about everything. You go into a store and you look at the DVD rack and you get looking and you say, Oh, I might like to... Before you pick that thing up and put it in your buggy, you better pray about that thing. There's a lot of nasty things on DVDs. I bought a couple of them through the years that I got home, and I ended up having to throw them away. I didn't look at them five minutes, and they were showing stuff I didn't want to see. And you'd never know from looking at the package. You look over the, Look, I tell you what, when you flip the package and you find that little thing on the bottom, it said, this is not rated, put that one back. Put that one, I'm guaranteed, put that one back. You don't want to look at that one. So, everything we do. Uh, everything we buy, everything, uh, you say, well, I have a routine, I do, pray about that too. Because things do change from time to time. Look, um, how many times have I preached now as your pastor, but I pray about it every single time I get up in the pulpit. So why do you do that? I want God to smile upon us. Amen? All right, we're going to look at some of the problem, these problems that come up, and we're going to study about that next week. Because cause Jesus seemed to be there when problems came up. And he can be in your life when problems come up. See, I thought this was about Jesus meeting people. Well, yeah. But don't you like it when Jesus comes and meets you? I sure do. Amen. Heavenly Father, help us now. Uh, Lord, thank you for our lesson. Uh, Lord, thank you for the great and wonderful day. I pray you help, folks. we got some folks out of town. we got some folks that... Uh, I, I, I think the, the, the trip made, made them so tired. And Lord, uh, I pray you help folks. Um, Lord, this is a busy time. The fair's here. It's, it's even hard to get to the church. So Lord, I pray you bring folks in. Lord, I really would like to see some visitors. Help us, Lord. And help the ones that come this morning. And Lord, help us to learn of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.